Hello, everyone. My name is Josh, and welcome back to Discourse on Radio GBX. I'm here with James, Dane, and Isaac, and we got the full crew this time for uh, hopefully a good show, because um, we got uh, some interesting topics to talk about, because the last uh, few weeks we've been talking about the Israel-Palestine situation and the protests, the different policies associated with like the passage of aid to Israel back what, two, three weeks ago? Yeah. And then the associated protests on college campuses that have been dominating news cycles. So we're going to continue that because there's been uh, some developments in regards to the protest. And the first kind of topic we're going to talk about is the dissolution of the protests at Columbia University in New York. So I'll go to James first. What do you kind of, what's your kind of take on the dissolution or like the kind of dissolving of those protests? Right. So... I do not condone police brutality. That is a terrible thing that we should really do some things to stop from happening. But on the flip side, it is kind of – it's an integral part of any any action involving civil disobedience. Like in the words of Martin Luther King, like to break a law and then willingly face the consequences for breaking that law is the highest – form of respect for it and on that i think without it's hard to say and find the words for this correctly but i think without protester arrest and removal like those actions bring a lot more visibility to the movement and just because of that like when you're getting attention like these the newsreels of peaceful protesters getting arrested and facing all these things brings a lot more awareness to something. So I'd really rather the police don't, but this is just kind of how protests go. Uh, Dane, yeah, you've been involved. You've kind of been in the trenches with some protests. So, kind of, yeah, what's your take? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely want to echo uh, what James said. Um, you know, as, as much as I hate to see um, you know, students and even professors sometimes getting brutally assaulted. Uh, like there was a picture that went viral of a uh, UW-Madison professor um, who basically was laying on the ground with a, a cop on his back. Um, as, as much as, you know, that's that's tragic and, and it's really sad to see happening, I do agree with what James was saying that um, – Although that's not the intent, the intent is, you know, to stand in, in, in solidarity. Um, it's an expected reaction, and it's a reaction that, frankly, occurs every time that there's some sort of um, huge cultural um movement like we've seen. I mean, it occurred in civil rights. It occurred in the anti-war movements in the 60s and the anti-apartheid movements um, in the 80s and 90s. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely it, it's sad to see, um, it, but it's, you know, it, it, it's expected. Um, I'll go to Isaac and then go back to James. Yeah, so I completely agree that, you know, with what James started with saying that, um arrests and police involvement in the protests. It does just kind of bring um, a spotlight to to the protests. I don't necessarily see that as like a positive or negative thing. Um, you know, the protesters are there to, to bring light to the topics they're protesting. So in some ways, I almost imagine that the protesters would see that at least the, the police presence as a positive thing for the message that they are trying to bring out. But then in terms of the actual arrests themselves um, and the police presence, you know, as long as nothing illegal is happening, as long as the protesters are not doing anything illegal, then, you know, OK, having a police presence is probably good just to just to, you know, hopefully, um, you know, make sure that there isn't, you know, conflict, especially when there is when there's an opposing pro-Israel presence. Um, on the campus as well because there has been instances of of you know a little you know I don't know what to call it but I guess skirmishes between the pro-Israel and then the anti-Israel um, protesters but at the same time when you know there are you know the instances of taking over certain school buildings or or you know, being in areas of campus that aren't, you know, allowed, 
then I understand why the protests are occurring. And, you know, as unfortunate as it is, it does make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, James. So, yeah, kind of going off what he was what what you were saying, uh, if if people are engaged in peaceful protesting and engage and breaking no laws under no circumstances, should the police show up and start arresting people? That is just violation of constitutional rights to assembly and free speech. But on the flip side, yeah, it is kind of a feature of activism. When you when you cross that line into civil disobedience, you are willing to put your body and your freedom on the line to advocate for a cause you believe in. And it ends up actually being a real positive for movements in the long run. Like uh, Martin Luther King in 1961 ran like sit-ins and demonstrations in Albany, Georgia to try and end segregation. And the police arrested demonstrators, but they did not engage in any violence. They bailed out most of the movement's leaders. And as a result, that movement attracted almost no nationwide attention and it just kind of fizzled out. But a year later, uh, engaged in activism in the Birmingham campaign against uh, Bull Connor, one of the most violent segregationists to ever hold public office, who sent attack dogs and fire hoses against kids. And those images made it to the mainstream and really changed the perception about the struggle for civil rights. So it is unfortunate, but it is kind of a key part of civil disobedience and that kind of activism. Uh, Dan? Yeah, I mean, I obviously like to kind of add on, um, you know, to, to what has been said. And uh, I, I think that the, you know, the police interactions, kind of like I mentioned previously, is expected. Um, but one of the things that's kind of a negative of the interactions with the police and, uh, as Isaac mentioned, you know, counter protesters, is that this current wave of protests is honestly kind of distracting the general public from what is going on still um, in Palestine. Like as we speak right now, um, you know, Rafa, which has been where the Israeli government has kind of been corralling refugees into, is, is currently under attack. And that's not something that I'm really, you know, been seeing broadcasted um, because, you know, people are, are, are worried about the protesters and you know, logically, it makes sense. Those are occurring in the United States. There's closer proximity, um, but yeah, I, th I think I think it is. Uh, it, it shows that a movement is powerful when students and other protesters are willing to put their bodies and their potential future livelihoods on the line for a cause. And we've seen that with um, refugees in Gaza have you know spray painted on the side of their tents like. Students of Columbia, we support you, you know, we see you. Um, so to me, as, as someone that's kind of involved in organizing, that's that's super impactful to see. Mm -hmm. uh, and then kind of going off of that for you, Dane, kind of what have you done in terms of organization, especially recently? Yeah, I mean, obviously, we've done we've been a lim little limited. Uh, we're a newer organization on on campus, um, so you know I've participated in in multiple um, you know demonstrations and organizations, um, basically starting since October in in the city, um, and then you know our group, uh, Students for a Democratic Society, has done a few things on campus as a, as a newer group. Though you know, kind of kind of limited. Um, you know, not a whole lot of commitment, um, but over there the Last week um, on, on May Day, May 1st, um, you know, we did a demonstration on campus uh, where we, we stood um, out by the, the bells uh, outside in the Phoenix Park and uh, read off the names of uh, thousands of children that have been uh, martyred. Uh, I think we got through about 86 out of 165 pages. We were out there for roughly three to four hours because, um, you know, we were not going to do an encampment and never had um either the support to do that or, um, you know, the, the commitment. Um, so in a way, this was kind of just us, like, standing in solidarity with those movements. Mm -hmm. uh, Isaac. Um, I just have a quick question, Dane. Um, you mentioned that it, it's, you didn't necessarily have the support um, for a full encampment. Um, why, why do you think that is? Yeah, I mean, so when when you look at a lot of the places that are are doing um, encampments, like you look at like Milwaukee uh, and and other bigger schools, 
um, they have a ton of, they're not only developed organizations um, like other chapters of um, Students for Democratic Society or chapters of um, Students for Justice in Palestine, um, though those organizations are, are far more developed and have a lot more people in them already um, than, than we did as an org. Um, they're also primarily in um, urban kind of city centers. Um, so, you know, Milwaukee, the campus um, kind of intercedes with many other, you know, restaurants and, and just city life. So they're going to get a lot more people like that. Um, and then they also, you know, have support of other um, political organizations throughout the city. So, you know, like if there's a, um, an anti-racist organization or, you know, like some sort of, um, you know, Milwaukee Muslim association or something like that, it's going to be easier for them to provide support to the already existing strong, um, student organizations. And that's something that just, we just don't have in, in Green Bay. So that was really never something we were looking at doing. Uh, James. So even if you did have the support, I don't think, I don't think it's something you could even pull off here just because after Kent state, uh, people started designing campuses in a way to counter protesters. Like you notice here, everything is really spread out. We have the tunnels. There are multiple ways to get in and out of things. Like you can't shut, like, even if you had a lot of support, it would require an insane amount of coordination to do it in any meaningful kind of way. Yeah, no, for sure. And I mean, obviously, like, you know, an, an encampment is different um, because it's outside. And then, yeah, there's also on top of that, the fact that UWGB is, you know, far away from the city of Green Bay. Uh, you know, like for me, I, I'm a commuter student. It's about like a 12 minute drive from my parents' house. So, you know, like it, it's not really like in, in the heart of what's going on. Uh, Isaac. One thing, one thing that um, James just mentioned is just like the, how, how campus is so spread out and how that kind of, you know, it, in a way it stops the, the larger impact of what a protester or a protesting group can do. Um, I do just want to point out that I personally think that that's a positive. And, and my reason for saying that is a protesting group can then protest, have a presence, but not restrict campus life, not restrict the, the, the impact that the protest would then have on other students. I mean, you look at Columbia, and they just recently announced that um, students can now choose up to two classes for a pass fail instead of just going for, for the grade. That impacts students. That just shows the general impact of every single student on campus because of what is going on. And if, if I understand correctly, they also needed to cancel the commencement at their, at their college. That's a big deal for every single senior student at that college. So, you know, having, the, having this campus set up the way it is and other universities and colleges being the same spread out that way it lessens the impact that the protest has on students but it doesn't get in the protesters right to protest mm -hmm. uh, james so i understand what you're saying um i understand where you're coming from i think kind of the fundamental point of civil disobedience in general is like and this is why you should only do it when it's something you really care about and you think is that important because the way it functions is to disrupt the it, you disrupt the function of an organization and hold that function hostage kind of un to force a negotiation and i get what you're like and obviously it's annoying nobody likes to have kick classes disrupted because of protesters that sucks that's but on the flip side the way it's it's almost impossible to protest in a way that both protests and doesn't annoy people. Like I briefly attended Dane's event the other on May Day, and there's a specific free speech zone that they could use right outside the university union, and it was regulated like what kind of speakers they could have. So the whole thing ended up being they had a protest there, but you'd never even notice there was a protest there unless you showed up and looked for it. Like not even you couldn't even hear it from twenty feet away. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of agree, um, you know, with with what James is is mentioning. I mean, obviously, um, you know, we, we don't want to 
we don't want to provoke anybody into, you know, doing anything as an act of counter protest. But I mean, it's like what we were talking about earlier with, you know, civil disobedience in the city, um, you know, during uh, during civil rights, when when people were engaging in sit ins, I was obstructing other people from, you know, going to the restaurant or wherever they were engaging uh, in in the sit in. Um, I mean, and, and we had people not um, not you know, in person, but there was people for what it's worth on the campus yik yak that, you know, were complaining about us being where we were and we weren't even obstructing any sort of pathway or anything. Um, and then, yeah, there was people that were like, um, you know, just obviously people are going to get mad about everything and it's not a big deal, but, um, yeah, I mean, even, even if you're doing something and, you know, following most of the rules and, and guidelines, there's still going to be people that are going to be, uh, you know, upset or, you know, questioning. Yeah. Uh, Isaac. So Dane, I really liked how you pointed out that, you know, through the campus Sikiak, you saw people complaining. Um, I, I think that's a perfect example of a good protest, you know, a, a protest that, people recognize, people see, and people are going to be frustrated with. You know, it's just kind of there. Nobody wants to walk down the street and hear chants or whatever else is going on. It, it annoys people. Nobody likes it, especially when they have opposing views. But that's the point. That It gets, it gets the point across. Mm -hmm. what, what I am very much against is when a protest goes to the extent of civil disobedience, where laws are broken, where people's lives are at risk. I mean, just looking at Columbia, looking at other universities where the protests are more intense, people are getting hurt. Yes, you know, protests are, protesters are getting hurt by police. Police are also getting hurt by protesters. You know, it, it's, there's conflict, and it's creating a situation that really isn't safe for anybody, especially just the random student who's just trying to walk to class, walk to their next exam, just trying to graduate so they can move on with their life. So, so that's the point, you know, it's when civil disobedience is actually involved, when there is illegal acts being taken. And I personally believe that that is never okay and should never be encouraged. Uh, I'll go the James and then Dan. So never under any circumstances, civil disobedience. Is, is that a question? Yeah, a question. yeah for sure. So, so how, how do you feel about like the marches from the civil rights era? How do you feel about MLK's sit-ins? Do you feel like that was, was that a justifiable use of nonviolence and civil disobedience considering the African-American community hadn't gotten equality and a lot of rights for over a hundred years after the civil war? Was that a justifiable use of civil disobedience? So I think that's a great question. So it, it, the way I look at it is it's complicated. There is a law and no one should be hurt, okay? So there were things that happened within the civil right protests that were not good. People were hurt and that is, that is never okay. So I'm, I'm never gonna say that, you know, any person from any side of any debate, you know, even if they're in the wrong, that they should be beaten up and hospitalized. Uh, I, I think that's illegal and that shouldn't happen. That's not good for anyone. So I never condone that type of violence. At the same time, good results can come from it. So while I'm going to say I never condone civil disobedience, good results can come from it. So I understand from the perspective of someone who is anti-Israel, someone who, who is pro-Palestine, they might say, okay, this act of civil disobedience is greater than the negatives that are going to come from the civil disobedience, right? I understand where someone could say that, but I think it is unethical to cause harm to society and to cause harm to the people around the protests. And But see, the thing, it's... It's incredibly complicated and every situation is different and I don't think you can quite reduce it to a binary because what like what, what would the moral calculus be like if we engage in this form of civil disobedience some individuals may be harmed many individuals are going to be disrupted it's going to cause economic damage but if we don't act then more people are going to be harmed by allowing this problem to continue 
there's there's always a complicated there's always a complicated calculus involved in it and you just like life and politics a lot of times you have to end up choosing the lesser evil and sometimes even though i don't think anybody really enjoys having to engage in civil disobedience sometimes it's the only tactic really available to a pop, to people that are kind of powerless and have no other way to make their voices heard so I guess just in response to that specifically, um, I, I do see where often that is the case. You know, it, civil right protests did bring about good. They, they, they brought a response from government. Looking at the protests right now at Columbia, at other universities, I'm not seeing where the protests are directly impacting policymakers. So, okay, you have a protest at Columbia, and, you know, they're protesting on campus. Okay, I, I'm not 100% sure what the campus or what school administration or what professors are going to do in D.C. I just want to add on to that because for Brown University, they had protests and they did agree to vote on – because a lot of – from my understanding, a lot – and obviously James and Dan can probably – Put more words to this, but for uh, the kind of the movement is kind of divest for all these kind of military contractors and other companies that maybe are kind of profiteering off of Israel or the war in Israel. So that's kind of what the notion is. But I'll go the I'll go the Dan for kind of response to that. Yeah, I mean, you, you kind of hit the nail on on the head a little bit with that, uh, Josh. And 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 my issue, I mean, I see what both of you guys are saying. Um, you know, but the thing with these these protests in on the campus and on on the national level is that if you want to make them go away, you agree to the students' demands or the people's demands on, on the national level. And that does not hurt anybody. Nobody would have to get hurt if the students' demands, like you mentioned, um, you know, BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanction, that type of thing, if that's met, that doesn't hurt anybody by the government or by the schools uh, implementing, you know, BDS, that doesn't that doesn't hurt anybody. The only thing it hurts is the profits that the investors and the shareholders on the foundations um, are making. And and then also to, to tie on ab about the um, the policy, um, you know, was mentioned, um, you know, that there hasn't really been any like policy response, um, so to speak. There's been like a counter response. You know, there's been uh, I'm not sure if you saw Isaac, but like the anti-Semitism uh, yeah. Act that was yeah, uh, that that was just uh, um, just passed, uh, where it was basically kind of changing the definition of anti-Semitic to being like criticizing the state of Israel. So it's kind of had a almost an opposite effect. Um, you know, kind of like what you were bringing up about. You know, there hasn't been like a positive policy that these have have implicated, but we have seen many campuses. Um, you know, issue divestment statements and that they're going to start looking into divestment. Uh, so, I mean, that's that's been a positive and for a lot of students has been considered kind of a win. And President uh, Joe Biden is going to, I believe, today be talking because he's already issued statements on the college protests and the kind of associated, you know, accusations of anti-Semitism. And he's going to be speaking on that, on that again today or has by the time of this uh, the show. Uh, James. So I actually do. I don't think the college protests are going to accomplish anything, not a single thing. But I still I still think they're very important to do. First, uh, the divestment, like a lot of universities are really struggling financially right now. Like there are universities that are worried about keeping their doors open for the next couple of years. And you know, the solution to that is we need to provide better funding to public education because you're not going to be worried about where your investments are when you're just worried about, you know, keeping the doors open. But, and second, I think, well, if you think back to the civil rights era again, Martin Luther King argued that the greatest stumbling block to civil rights wasn't segregationists or Klan members. It was white moderates that either weren't interested in doing anything or didn't, weren't aware of anything. And I think a lot of the student protests are to get on the news, to you know, bring exposure to the movement, to make people care, to show people why they should care. Because you know, whether you agree or not, it's some powerful imagery. Like you see people willing to risk their 
education, their bodies, their freedom for people on the other side of the world. But I think the real power of this movement comes from the Vote Uninstructed movement, which kind of harkens back to some earlier activists like Malcolm X or Emma Goldman, who argue that not participating in a prejudiced system is the most powerful thing they can do. So I think that is actually the key to anything meaningful happening in this regard, but the college protests are still an important way to raise cultural awareness. Mm. I, I really like, James, that you brought that to the, to the uninstructed vote. Um, because I, I do see that that has already had an impact, particularly on the Biden campaign. And I can see that going forward into the future where he really needs those votes. And, you know, we're looking at young people. I mean, that, that, is, that is a group of people that Biden really needs to show up in his favor if he wants to run away with this 2024 presidential election. And if, if people our age, college students, if young adults, if we're not showing up to support him, I'm not sure exactly where his campaign is going to go. I don't know, you know, what the average Democrat thinks on that. I'm not a Democrat. So for me... I'm, you know, not going to be against that because I can say, okay, is this ele election going to go Republican? Great for me. But for the Democrat, you know, I think that will have a wide range of, of challenges. And I can see where, you know, for that uninstructed vote, I assume the hope is that it'll have impact in the long term where the Democrat Party won't put up for for president, someone who's overall seen as as a, a moderate like Biden is. Dan. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, definitely we kind of talked about that a little bit, um, you know, back around around the um, the midterm. But, um, you know, CNN recently did a poll for, you know, what it's worth that uh, in ages 18 to 34, about 62 percent of the people surveyed were dissatisfied Um you know, with with Biden, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be voting for Trump, right? It just it means, in in the poll uh, sake, that they're dissatisfied. And so it's interesting for me, and uh, and I'm really actually happy to have both James and Isaac here as somebody who doesn't really identify, um, you know, with either political party. Obviously, I I lean more progressive, um, but it's interesting because it seems like both parties have significant splits amongst. Their voter base. I mean, you saw the other day um, the National College Democrats have come out with a statement that goes directly against Biden's um, stance on on uh, on Israel. And to me, seeing that, like, yeah, I, I, you know, I can consider I can consider that a win. Um, but then, you know, on the, on the flip side, in the, in the Republican Party. You have the the MAGA versus kind of traditional conservative split. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to see you know, what happens and, and what amends the parties kind of try to make uh, to, to kind of unify their, their base. Uh, James. Yeah, well, I know, I know Dane's leftist. He was part of the college Dems. But as this as the situation unfolded, I could just over this last year, I could just see him gradually lose all interest in being associated with the Democrats. But as a fairly average Democrat um, and chair of the college Democrats, a lot of our strategy at the moment is putting forward a lot of local candidates like this is the person running for state rep in your area. This is the person running for Congress in your area. This is your senator. And while you're at it, why don't you vote for Biden, too? Like, so I can tell you that I'll be voting for Biden. But just like in 2020, I won't be very excited about it. I, I'm voting for him because I think Trump is worse in every single way, not because I actually like the guy. So, you know, I, I'm curious your opinions on this. So, you know, Bernie Sanders has come out a few times now saying that Biden is going to lose a lot of support from from his stance on Israel, being in favor of Israel um, in the conflict. And, you know, there's been action in that regard. I mean, we've seen aid going toward toward Israel more recently. And so, OK, back to Sanders, he, he said that Biden is going to lose support and his stance is quite different. So I'm curious if there's, you know, anyone, either James or Dane, you've seen who's who's 
you know, a popular enough figure in, in the Democrat Party or someone who could kind of, you know, move into that, who could be a potential presidential candidate either this year or in the near future. Dan. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good question. And obviously, you know, going to have to do um, a little bit of thinking on that. But just off the top of my head, um, I mean, most of the people that um, that I support are like, you know, aren't typical Orthodox Democrats. You know, Cornell West um, is, is a huge idol of mine. And, um, you know, he's obviously not a Democrat. Yeah, he's Lean, running as an independent right, this year. Right, right. Leans more. Uh, but I think Bernie is an independent, too, I believe. Uh, Bernie technically is. Yeah, Bernie. Bernie. Uh, yeah. with um, Yeah. I mean, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know of really any. I mean, obviously, you know, there's uh, Ilhan Omar and, and uh, Rashida Tlaib have, have been very, um, you know, pro-Palestine uh, and have been a voice for that. And, um, you know, Rashida Tlaib actually getting censured uh, in the House, which is really sad to see. She was sticking up for her people and, and got censured. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's really not that many, uh, to be honest, Isaac, uh, at least in my opinion. And, you know, uh, I guess one that's also not really a Democrat, but, um, you know, Cenk Uger uh, was running for president and, you know, he disagrees very vehemently uh, with the Biden ad admin. And he's, you know, a little bit to the right of me on on a few things. Um, but, you know, he's something that um, I personally wouldn't wouldn't mind too much, uh, you know, with him. Making he did run, but making you know like a substantial run for office. Yeah, I, th I think the only issue with him like running for president is that he's not a natural born citizen, so he'd need to like jump through a bit more hoops to yeah to I, become president, which is always an interesting thing based on because we don't we've never had a president who yeah I, was not was like any kind of foreign born. Yeah, I, I remember him actually. I remember watching a video of him talking about that, and I can't. I'll have to see if I can pull it up. Because um, yeah, he was saying you know there's either some sort of loophole or you know was bringing up another politician who ran that wasn't born. I'll, I'll have to find that while while everybody's uh, discussing. Yeah, you just you made me think of that when you you mentioned him. So uh, James, well, I I recently met with Representative Ro Khanna from I think California's 13th or 14th district. And there have been a lot of Democrat politicians that have, you know, released statements calling for an immediate ceasefire, which, you know, has has the same has about the same weight as a UN resolution calling for pretty much anything. But Rokano is a little bit different in that he voted against sending any foreign aid to Israel and opposes that Biden is, which again, it's not perfect, but there are some Democrats who are advocating to end aid to Israel. So the more I understand about this situation, the more complicated it ends up being. Like Netanyahu turns out has argued in public that a well-funded Hamas is key to Israel's goals. Uh, Hamas has kind of, Hamas attacked aid workers, stole foreign aid and the Israelis are committing genocide. There are a lot of bad actors on every single side of this with the innocent people of Palestine stuck in the middle of it. And I don't know. I don't know how to solve it. The more I, re I thought I knew a little bit before, but now I realize that I really don't know. But the one thing that I'm certain of is that we cannot be sending aid to Israel. So, you know, just... I'd love to come at it from a, from a very different angle. Um, so I, I see where, you know, I, you know. Well, I'll I'll start with this, James. I am at the same place as you. I have absolutely no clue how this is going to be solved, and I have no clue what good, true, and realistic solutions are. Like you know, a lot has been talked about. But looking at Israel, looking at Hamas, I don't see where either side is truly going to agree on anything. They've With, both been sabotaging peace, peace talks. And, and it's true. Both, both sides completely have. You know, where I, I guess, differ, and I don't want to focus on this too much, but it, but it is worth saying is I am more sensitive um, and sympathetic to Israel. 
Um, and I, I don't know how much we want to go into detail there because, you know, here we're talking more about, um, you know, the actual, you know, what might happen in terms of actually bringing peace. But to tell the truth, I don't see it coming in the very near future. I really hope it does. But I, I do think that the longer it continues, the worse it's going to get. And the more the more struggles we're going to just continue to see in the future. Uh, Dan? Yeah, I mean, I, I would like to um, kind of respond to that. Um, I mean, from everything that I've seen, the, uh, the continuation of this issue um, pretty much lies solely on the Netanyahu administration. Uh, Hamas actually recently said um, that if, you know, Israel releases their hostages, that they would agree to a two-state solution on a 1967 um, terms. And Netanyahu, you know, has, has been facing calls um, from the, the population of, of uh, Israel to get the hostages um, Hamas's hostages released, and Netanyahu said that he was going to invade Rafa whether or not the hostages were released. So, you know, th th there is, um, you know, a solution, but then, you know, we can get into the weeds of, well, what do we do about, you know, Netanyahu? I know, I think when we were talking about it a couple of weeks ago, we talked about, you know, would it ever be possible for, you know, a, a different government intervention, but then you run the issue of sovereignty, but yeah, basically, uh, the long and short is they have made efforts to, you know, at least say, like, we want to be done. We'll at least accept a two state when, you know, we, we talked in the past uh, in my ideal world. That's not the perfect solution. Um, but, you know, they they've kind of made amends uh, asking asking for that, which have been denied. And we're seeing that with the invasion of Rafa. So do you think that? Like, will ever get to any of that? Like, do you think that's kind of the most inevitable, salute, like, plausible solution outside of, like, either side decimating the other? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, that that's, that's the most plausible solution. I think with, um, you know, with Netanyahu and his head of security, it's Mar Ben Gavir, who is, you know, extremely extremely prejudiced against uh arabic people i don't think that's ever going to happen with with those two in power i think it would there would need to be some significant change uh in in who's running things um over there or just you know global um support for the cause but yeah i definitely think that that's the most like tangible probably realistic option uh james so well i think i think that is a reasonable that would be a reasonable ask. And I think you know, the 1967 borders is something Israel should do. But if you look like, so I'm not disagreeing that that is something I think should happen. But if you look at like the broader picture just a little bit, I don't think Hamas is, in, is asking for that out of any real interest in negotiating just because they're negotiating from a place of weakness, but making demands like they're winning. So that it's they're they're fighting a battle of perception, trying to make themselves look better, and then it and I think that asking for that in a negotiation is actually counterproductive, because then it it gives the nation of Israel like the excuse that Hamas is making unreasonable demands to a ceasefire, and because they're making unreasonable demands, there is not going to be any peace. I think that actually makes the whole situation worse, but. I also believe that Hamas leadership is being funded by Netanyahu, so I don't think we're ever going to get a workable ask out of them that Israel will accept. Uh, I'll go to Isaac and then Dan. So um, James brought up how, how you know, I, I guess what, what the challenges of, of working with Hamas and actual, like, looking, looking toward peace, um, or more specifically, that, you know, that Hamas isn't necessarily looking directly for peace. But I just want to confirm, James, is that is is that what you said? Or? Yeah, I do not believe Hamas wants peace. I don't believe that negotiation was proposed in any sort of seriousness. And even if it was, I don't think Israel would ever accept it while they're winning. Yeah, I, I do completely agree with that. Not that I'm saying that it's good, but that's the reality of the situation. I, I, I feel you there, too. It, you know, it, it's incredibly frustrating to see what is going on um, and to just to see it all, you know, any peace 
negotiations collapse. But I do agree with James that I do see where it is both sides. Um, with in in terms of looking for peace, you know, Hamas. I, I I truly see them as a radical terrorist organization that is not concerned with the actual people within the region. A group like that is willing to do anything for whatever ends they want. And much of those ends are political and are religious. And I think that is incredibly dangerous to to work with. And I do believe that that is why Israel, or not Netanyahu specifically, is not simply looking at peace as a true plausible opportunity right now. Because Hamas is not looking at their people and are concerned with, you know, their safety or, or really bringing about end of conflict for the people's safety. They're only looking at their ends. I mean, just, just a perfect example, you know, many people in the U.S. around the world are, are saying that what is going on in Gaza is a genocide. And I totally see why that is a claim that, that people are, are, are talking about. At the same time, I blame Hamas for the genocide. And my reason for saying that, one, they kicked off the war to begin with. I'm not going to say Israel was completely clean, that they hadn't done anything wrong. You know, I, I do see where they are have been for years encroaching on Palestine land. But then within this conflict itself, Hamas, the way they fight, the way they actually carry out the war, they put their, their military personnel, the, the actual terrorists, in the towns, in the homes of the local people. So in order to, you know, okay, you're going to send... You're going to send a missile strike on Israel. And what's Israel's response going to be? You're going to attack the military personnel, right, of Hamas. Well, the military personnel are stationed within the towns, within the people, in their homes. So in order to get to Hamas, you're getting to the local innocent people. So, you know, is a genocide going on? Sure. Sure. I mean, there's, there's, you know, lots of innocent people are dying. But when you look at why, why is that happening? It's Hamas putting their own innocent people in the lines of fire. Uh, Dan. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I got a lot, a lot to address um, from, from what both of you guys were saying. Um, the first thing that I'd like to address is that this is by no means a, a demand, a, a um, Hamas demanding something that's a winning demand. This is them making a concession, them demanding a two-state um, solution. That's them making a concession. Um, and and then I would pose a question of what do you what do you you know propose they demand? They they you know whether or not they they're truly motivated uh, to end the conflict. I mean I I believe they are. They don't want nobody wants to die. Um, but you know, saying that that they're not motivated motivated by peace is is complete speculation at this point um, from us. Um, and then you know, you mentioned about the challenges of working with Hamas. What about the challenges of working with Israel? Israel does not respect any country's sovereign borders. They routinely bomb um, under the guise of of terrorism other countries violating their sovereignty. They basically declared war on Iran, um, you know, by uh, by destroying uh, an embassy, and you know the the whole. Um, the argument about Hamas not being concerned with uh, with their citizens too is, um, you know, I guess it and the human shield argument, uh, you know, was it was it was kind of uh, brought up about Hamas hiding amongst the populace. And and if we think about it, a good solution to that, if people are hiding, if Hamas, you know, is using people as human shields is to send in the special forces. Israel has one of the best, uh, most highly trained special forces program on the planet. When we were looking for bin Laden, we didn't carpet bomb Pakistan. We sent in the special forces. Yes, did some innocent people die? Yeah, but a whole lot fewer died that way than just carpet bombing and leveling a population. 
If Israel was truly concerned about getting Hamas out and not killing innocent Palestinian lives, that that's what they would have done. That's the that's the the only solution. If if there's a um, if there's a hostage situation or or you know terrorist making a bomb threat at, at a bank in the United States or or at a school. We don't blow up the school and kill everybody in the school. We send in people that are trained in that regard. And and so there hasn't been any sort of effort on the Israeli side to not engage in, in killing of the Palestinian people. The Flower Massacre is a prime example of that. You have people in Gaza that are eating leather because they don't have food. And a UN, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if it was UN, but an aid truck comes in and, you know, people storm the aid truck because they're hungry and most of them are extremely malnourished and they open fire and, and, and start killing people. And, and so to me, you can't, yes, it's hard, you know, to, to combat um, terrorism, but then I would also just like to end of, of, you know, asking the question of what causes radicalization? Radicalization just doesn't happen randomly. That, that happens when a specific set of material conditions are met. And that's, it's happened throughout history. It happens in the United States, um, you know, in low income areas with, with, um, with gangs. And that's why we see crime. People are radicalized because of conditions on which they grow up in, which allows them to lean on things like religious fundamentalism and, and nationalism to get them out of those situations. Uh, James. So I will agree that, yeah, re religious radicalism, it's not defined by any one religion. It's kind of a function of horrible living conditions. That's what radicalizes people. But I think maybe I didn't articulate this clearly enough before. Israel is playing both sides of this conflict. Israel has territorial ambitions. Israel wants the territory that Palestinian people are living on. They have been encroaching on that for decades. But Israel also directly funds and owns Hamas. Israel wants the territory. Israel also funds the group that makes the action to justify Israel's reaction in taking that territory, which th that is why it's such a no-win situation. That's why I believe Hamas really doesn't is, isn't meaningfully advocating for peace. And I think the only actual solution is the world needs to express to Israel that this it, we need to sanction them. We need to seize all support for them. We need to turn them into a pariah state because there is no other solution because Israel is controlling both sides of the conflict. Uh, Isaac. So, um, James, I guess, you know, I haven't heard much about Israel actually funding Hamas. You know, it's something I've heard before, um, but, you know, I, I guess I'm curious where you got that from. If, if there's like a particular article or, you know, uh, and, and maybe maybe it might take a bit, to, bit of time. There's to... one on the New York Times, like buying quiet inside the Israeli plan that propped up to Hamas. Netanyahu gambled that a strong Hamas would keep the peace. Or at least that's what he said, public facing. And he's lobbied the Qatari government to send millions and millions of dollars a month into the Gaza Strip directly to Hamas. So, like, they're getting funded at Netanyahu's whim. And you can't, like, you follow the money. He's the one in charge of them. He's calling the shots. And this attack happened right when Netanyahu was getting criticized and almost about to be ousted for his unpopular judicial reforms. And that's why I don't think we're seeing any meaningful ne negotiations between Hamas and Israel because Hamas has n no interest in actually achieving peace. I want to interject just real quick. Uh, do you think that 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 uh, those reports that came out, I don't know, towards the beginning, I guess relatively towards the beginning of the war, um, that like Israel had like has some foreknowledge of the October 7th attack, do you think that is kind of a factor in that? I believe that is. I don't remember the exact details at the moment, but yeah, there Israel. There are plenty of reports that Israel had foreknowledge and chose not to act because Israel was looking for an excuse to act to distract from the controversy that was going to get Netanyahu removed.
uh, thing. Yeah, and I mean, I I haven't heard anything. I know that you know there are ties with the uh, Qatari government, and that's where you know most of the diplomatic talks um, seem to have been taking place. Um, I do know that there was, you know, an allegation, I think, from uh, a former associate of uh, Yasser Arafat, who was the um, who, you know, ran um, the the PLO, um, that uh, there was originally funding for Hamas from Israel. Um, You know, I'm definitely going to have to look into, uh, you know, that that New York Times article. Um, But it also should be brought up that the only reason why Hamas is in a position of power in Gaza is because there was forced elections from the Bush administration. Um, They mentioned after Arafat was killed that uh, they weren't ready to hold elections. And, you know, the U.S. and and Bush in in typical fashion were like too bad. And basically the people voted in Hamas. The common argument you hear is, you know, they they voted in Hamas. Quite frankly, it was because, you know, the election was forced and there are other political parties um, because I believe Hamas is technically a political party. Uh, There are other parties that are calling for the same thing, the remnants of the PLO. Uh, I believe there's a group in the West Bank as well. Um, I'm not exactly sure what they're called off the top of my head, but yeah, I just kind of wanted to add that. Uh, Isaac. I I like that Dane um, mentions that Hamas very well could have been originally funded um, from Israel. And I, I don't have research or anything or counter research to say that Netanyahu and Israel is funding or indirectly funding Hamas right now. So I, I, don't, I don't have anything to, to say that that's true or to say that it's not true. When, it, when looking at, you know, terrorist organizations, this is something we've seen before. Osama bin Laden was originally supported by the United States. He was, he was someone who was funded and trained by the U.S. military. When, you know, after, you know, things weren't going the way Osama bin Laden wanted it to, he, you know, very obviously, and um, as we all know, funded and, and carried out terrorist attacks in the U.S., so, you know, could this be a situation similar to to that where Hamas was originally supported by Israel and then just kind of went rogue outside of Israel's, you know, hopes? That could be the case. I'm, I'm not going to, you know, claim that that is the case or that, you know, is very likely, but it's something we've, we've said before. And I, I don't want to to say, OK, Israel at some point funded Hamas, therefore, that's still the case, and Israel wants Hamas to be there. I, 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 you know, could it be the case? Yeah, it's it's always a possibility, but I'm not going to jump to that. Uh, Dane. Yeah, I mean, and I, I, I think that I actually pretty much agree with what you said, uh, Isaac. You know, I, as much as I'm not a fan of of uh, Israel, you know, I I haven't really seen anything, um, and you know, like I said, it could just be lack of research, but. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen anything to say that they're currently, um, you know, funding them. And obviously with any sort of claim of, of funding, it is disputed. And I like that you, you know, you mentioned um, bin Laden and, and his ties with the CIA and, and them fighting against uh, the Soviet Union in uh, Afghanistan. Um, but, you know, that, that, that also kind of ties into the question that I mentioned earlier of, of what radicalizes people. And I, I think that, quite honestly, is, is the whole problem in the, in the Middle East is is the U.S.'s foreign policy stance throughout the 20th century was to basically create disorder all around the world, um, you know, so that they could either step in or say, you know, give them cause or, um, you know, then the Soviet Union or whoever the um, opposite polar power would be to step in. And it's just sad for me to see that, you know, there are there are people that are growing up that see their only way out um, as as radicalization. And, and I think that that's something that, you know, everybody, not just the people in here, but all of our politicians need to be aware of is is what causes people to get radicalized. Uh, James. So, yeah, it's on record that and I'm not going to argue against what causes people to get rad- radicalized, but you've got on record uh, I'm going to butch this name, Bezalel Smallrich, who is Netanyahu's finance minister, 
argued that the PLA is a burden and Hamas is an asset. And they did directly fund Hamas about $30 million a month right up until the attacks with uh, Netanyahu's goal as maintaining, well, I can't, there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind closed doors. I cannot speak to what the exact purpose of these funds are, but Netanyahu is on the record as wanting to keep Hamas strong, which will keep them divided from the PLA, which divide the Palestinian people to further Israeli interests. So at the very minimum, you have verified, you have verified sources that these funds were not spent for the good of the Palestinian people. They were spent to advance Israeli interests, which is kind of taking over their land. Uh, Dane. Yeah, um, I mean, and, and obviously, if that is you know substantiated and everything, I think that just kind of makes and 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 solidifies my argument that the current administration in the state of Israel needs to be changed, and that we cannot work with them. And you know, if they are funding, um, you know, giving themselves probable cause uh, in, in quotes um, to you know commit the acts that they're committing, then that should be obvious to anybody that we cannot support. Uh, an administration that's doing something like that. They need to be a pariah state like North Korea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, I guess the problem that I have with a pariah state, though, is how does that solve, um, you know, the acts that, that are that are being committed? You know, like, and it's obviously hard, you know, with the UN is not really the, you know, known for being a well-functioning form of uh, democracy throughout the world. Um, and I have my qualms with the UN, too. I should make that known. Um, but, yeah, I think, you know, obviously a pariah does have, I mean, you know, some detrimental effects. But, I mean, it doesn't stop the government from doing whatever they want it, to do. It doesn't. But Israel is very, very, very dependent on foreign aid, especially ours. True. And I think that is pretty much the only reasonable tool we have to force it to stop is this stops immediately or you're done, you're cut off. That's I think that's the only action that will actually accomplish anything with how complicated this is. And it probably will cause more problems too because nothing is ever simple and clean. But I think that's the only meaningful action. Uh, Isaac. Yeah, I think, I think the last thing you said there, James, is spot on that, you know, it would cause cause more problems. Hopefully, you know, if, if that were to happen, I see that there would be potential for better long-term solutions. There very well could be. It does make me nervous that Hamas would simply continue and that what was started would just, you know, continue to happen where, where the attacks would continue. And while Israel would lose funding, that would, could really take down their entire government, their entire society. Um, I'm not sure it would actually get them out of the war. Because as, as much as, you know, Palestine feels encroached upon, Israel does too. They're, they're in the middle of many countries that are very um, against them in every single way. And, and I'm not sure that funding is, is going to bring peace or if it's actually just going to bring more conflict targeted at Israel. Well, you can you can threat you can threaten to withhold it on the condition of regime change. It, the same concept is civil disobedience. You disrupt an ability to function to force negotiation. I'm not sure if I would just trust that. You know, I could see. Okay, you know, do I do I personally think Netanyahu is a good, upstanding guy who I want in office? No, I would never claim that. Never met the guy, so you know, I don't know. But do I want, you know, just someone else in office there? Potentially, but I, I'm not. I, I'm not sure if that's even going to be good. We might get someone who is even more radical than Netanyahu is. I, I don't. You know, I'm not going to pretend I understand the political situation in Israel in, in their own, you know, government structure. What the people want. I haven't heard that. That's something I haven't researched. But with the current military conflicts that are going on, I wouldn't be surprised if they want someone who is who who is going to even do more and who's going to even fight harder than Netanyahu has. Uh, Dane, I'm going to give you the last word. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely um, 
I definitely kind of agree, um, you know, with you, Isaac, on on that, you know, talking about how the possibility of Hamas continuing if uh, if aid was, you know, removed. And I think that that's a, a possibility for sure. And I think the reason as to why is quite clear. I mean, if if any kid is is growing up in the conditions that they're growing up in, the first thing that they're going to do when they grow old is, is join Hamas. That's the first thing that they're going to do. If if I was in if I was in that position, obviously, you know, I don't like conflict. But sometimes, you know, conflict is is the only way uh, the only way out. So I, I think th- that would be very much be a concern. Um, I think the aid would probably need to be reversed or gone to humanitarian instead of you know obviously like military support. But. Mm-hmm. Uh, good discussion, long discussion, definitely a lot to think about, definitely a lot to continue talking about in the future. So we'll make sure to pick this back up in a future show. But I'd like to thank everyone for listening. I'd like to thank James, Dane, and Isaac for coming back and talking about this issue. Hey, thanks uh, for the debates. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, this was a great discussion. Hope to do it again. Uh, but for now, good luck on finals, everyone, and have a good week. We'll see you next time.